Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priests and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that is to say, following Christ, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then he said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And then the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. And they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. So then Ananias said, Lord, I've heard many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Then Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, came and sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and he was baptized. Now, I just want to quickly turn over again to the book of Acts, and we're going to be in chapter number 26, and then I want to begin reading at verse 16. This is Paul recounting before Agrippa the events that we just read about in Acts chapter 9. There have been quite a few years between these two events, and now he's going before Agrippa, the Roman leader, and he's explaining to him his ministry. We're going to start in verse 16, where Jesus is speaking to Paul. He said to him, But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you this for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith through me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. And for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Now you will remember Saul of Tarsus. Now this would be eventually a man that we refer to as Paul. But I think sometimes we may forget the fact that there was a time in Saul's life when he did not believe in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that he made havoc of the church. He did everything in his power to destroy Christianity. He traveled around. He was persecuting. He was doing many such things. And he had even received permission from the chief priest to go as far as Damascus to take people bound, whether men or women, back to Jerusalem to stand trial for what he had done. 
Now, later in his life, and of course, when we know him as Paul, he reflects on this, talking about how he was the chief among sinners because he had destroyed the church and he had wasted it. But nevertheless, God had shown him mercy because the things that he did, he said he did them ignorantly in unbelief. So here's Saul. He believes he's doing God a service. And all of the sudden, a light shines down from heaven, knocks him to the ground. Now, we don't know if he was riding on an animal. We don't know if he was walking. But we know that it knocked him to the ground. Jesus began to speak to him. And he said these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And here's what he said. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is an expression that was used by Jesus to show the way the Holy Spirit was dealing with Saul. He used the analogy of goading him and using a goad. Now, an ox goad was like a spear. And what they would do in those days, as I've mentioned it before, they would walk alongside an animal when they were plowing a field. Now, how many of you know they didn't have John Deere tractors back then? They were plowing with oxen. And sometimes the ox would be a little bit rebellious. So he would try to go this direction instead of going straight. So they would have someone walking alongside. And if the person driving him couldn't keep him under control, they would goad this animal with this sharp stick. Now, there was a man by the name of Shamgar in the Old Testament that took an ox goad and he slew a number of men with it. So this is a vicious weapon if it is used a certain way. And Jesus said, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, these animals sometimes, even though they would be being goaded, they would be exceptionally rebellious. They would just keep pushing and pushing until their sides would probably be bloodied by the sharpness of this ox goad. But they didn't want to go where the driver was leading them. And this is the analogy Jesus is using. He said, Saul, it is hard for you. It is painful for you. It is difficult for you to keep resisting the dealings of the Holy Spirit. You see, everything that was happening in Saul's life, no matter whether he was going to persecute, whatever, the Holy Spirit was dealing with him. The Holy Spirit was trying to bring him to a place where he was in response to him. I think about when he was standing and holding the coats of the people who were persecuting and stoning Stephen to death. You see, it was Saul who heard the words of Stephen when he said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. And you see, saints, this is the issue in the world today. The Holy Spirit is dealing with people. Ever since the fall of man, the Holy Spirit has been dealing with people. When you get to the book of Genesis chapter 6, everything had gone totally off the rails. The Bible said the thoughts and the imaginations of men were only evil continually. But yet there is a verse that said, my spirit will not always strive with man, for he is also flesh. In other words, what was happening? God was striving with people. He was doing everything he could. Possibly just his spirit moving, whether on the other side of the world or wherever they were. Whether it was the preaching of, of Noah when he was preaching to the people. You need to get on the ark. You need to get your act together. It's going to rain. God is going to bring judgment. But nevertheless, they were resisting and resisting and resisting. But he said to them, my spirit will not always strive. How many of you know that is some sad stuff right there? I think about right here in America, saints. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is striving with people every day? Right here in Missouri, right here in Buchanan County, right here in St. Joe, the Holy Spirit is striving with people to get them to turn before it's too late. Because how many of you know time is running out? Time is running out. I remember when I was a young person riding to church on the church van. I remember the pastor and the preachers and even the evangelists who would come. They would just thunder and thunder and thunder. Jesus is coming back. Get your house in order. It is time to turn to the Lord. But saints, listen, we are farther from God this morning than we have ever been by a long margin. And there is no signs whatsoever that people are going to straighten up and turn back to the Lord. I was thinking about just this last week, and I don't know if you kind of kept up on it, but the Queen of England passed away this week. When she was living, was the head of the Church of England. And even though, you know, she may have come from a little bit different brand of Christianity, 
there was still a sense in which, as I have always understood it, that she tried to kind of keep things on the rails as best as she could. She would talk about Christ. She would talk about the importance of Christ. And she was towing the line. And she's been doing this, saints, understand, since Harry S. Truman was in office. How many of you know that was 1952? That is a long time. She has been the queen. She has been the head of the church. But now there's a changing of the guard. Her son is coming in. And they don't know what direction he's going to go. And I've heard people talk about there's a lot of pressure on him to try to kind of make everything smooth over for everybody. You know, we're not going to really push Christianity. We can just kind of have a religion where, you know, we can have the Muslims and we can have this group and all this. And we'll just all just get along. How many of you know, listen, that's a completely different religion. Serving a completely different God than we're talking about. Jesus said, there's, or the scripture said, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved with the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other name. There is no other way. And saints, listen, what we need in America, what they need in England, what we need around the world is a revival of the Holy Spirit. We need God to pour his spirit out upon people so that their life can be transformed in the same way that Paul was transformed. You know, a lot of times we think, well, it can be just a simple thing. Did you know he was far away from God, though he thought he was close? When God started dealing with him, he was knocked completely to the ground and was blinded. How many of you ever got saved like that? Anybody? Anybody? God get your attention that way? Knocked you to the ground, blinded you? How many of you spent three days and you didn't eat neither food nor water? Think of that. You hadn't eaten for three days. You hadn't drank anything. You had been in prayer for three days. I wonder what it was like for Paul. When the revelation came to his mind, he'd been persecuting, possibly killing people who really were serving Christ. And that he was wrong. He was totally off base. I couldn't even imagine how that would have impacted him. There was, as it were, scales that were on his eyes. And one preacher said it like this. It, that blindness showed him the spiritual blindness he had been moving in. He was totally blind spiritually. But he was doing these things thinking he was doing right. But Jesus said, you're kicking against the goads. You're resisting the dealings of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to acknowledge the fact that what you were being told was right. You see, he didn't want to hear what Stephen had to say. He didn't want to listen to it. He was going to continue to believe what he believed until God intervened. And listen, saints, that is a dangerous place to be. I'm going to believe what I'm going to believe. I'm going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to keep on doing this. Even though God is dealing with me, I'm going to keep on doing my own thing. That is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. What ended up happening? Paul was praying. He was down there. He was in prayer. He had a vision. There's a man by the name of Ananias that's going to come. And they're going to pray for you. And Ananias is like, Lord, I don't know about this. You know what kind of man he is? Like, okay, I know who he is. I've got my hand on his life is what he was basically saying. So what did he do? He went down to a street that was called straight. And this word straight, saints, is the same word that is used all the way back in John the Baptist's ministry. Make his path straight. So it, it's almost like a picture that God was getting his life straightened out. He was changing his mind and he was getting him on the right track. What did he do? He laid his hands on Saul. He laid his hands on him. Scales fell, as it were, from his eyes. And then he obviously received the Holy Spirit. And he immediately got up and began preaching Jesus Christ. Not just in a simple way. He was thundering the word of God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Saints, listen what we need today. There is a hardness of heart upon the people today in this land that we need ministers that will thunder God's word. This manby pamby kind of can't even get through anybody. It's got to end. We need people who will thunder God's word. That when they begin to preach, people begin to get under conviction. You see, I was talking to somebody just yesterday, and they were talking to me about Jimmy Swagger. And it's like, you know, brother, I don't know what you think about Jimmy Swagger. And they say, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, let me tell you what I know about Jimmy Swagger. 
I grew up on a pretty steady dose of that because when I go to my grandma's house, though my parents weren't in church, she would watch him all the time. And I remember one time being invited, not by my parents or grandparents or any of them, totally a separate situation, by a co-worker to go to a Jimmy Swagger can, uh, meeting. As a matter of fact, I believe it was at uh, Kemper Arena in Kansas City. This was a huge arena. I mean, I don't know how many people it seated. Probably 15,000, 20,000 people. And we couldn't get a seat early, so we had to sit up in the back. And this man that invited me was a very large man. I want to say he was six foot five, 300 pounds. He was a man's man. He was a tough guy. He had been in Vietnam. He was an auto mechanic. And he had invited me to come. Here I was all about 16 years old. You know, I, I didn't know a whole lot about God. been to church. And I remember as we were sitting up behind listening to Jimmy Swaggart preach. He was going back and forth like this. And I'm listening and all that. And uh, all of a sudden I looked to my right. And this man is rocking back and forth, saints, like this. And tears are just coming down his eyes like this. I mean, he's like he's fit to be tied. I mean, he's going back and forth. His body's shaking. Here's this burly big man doing all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, you know, what did he say? You know, I'm thinking, I didn't have any sense. I didn't know anything about church. I didn't know what Holy Ghost conviction was. I didn't know. I thought, you know, I truly, I'll tell you what I believe. I thought that he had said something that triggered something in his mind. And he was having a flashback from when he was in Vietnam. That's what I believed. That's what I thought. Something's happened. He said something. But see, saints, listen. He was so under conviction. He was trembling in his seat. He was weeping. He was going back and forth because he was under such conviction of sin. And I didn't even realize or know what he was doing until years later when I was sitting and been invited to a passion play. And I was sitting towards the back. And I was watching this play go on. And I remember the person up on the front crying out. How many of you know what I'm talking about? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And just, I'm telling you, I came under such conviction in that moment. Because I realized that it was my sins that put Jesus on the cross. It was my transgressions that put him there. Not my neighbors, not a trillion people who've lived and will live into the future. But it was my sins. And I began to tremble, saints, in that seat. I began to shake. My knees began to knock together like this as I would sit there back and forth. And it was like at that moment, then I knew what that friend had been through when he was hearing Jimmy Swagger preaching. And it helped me to understand, saints, listen, when God deals with us, when he really deals with us, that is when it's time to respond to the Lord. If he speaks into your heart, you don't have to be shaken. You don't have to fall out on the ground. You don't have to foam at the mouth. You don't have to do anything like that. But if you sense that God is strongly dealing with you, it is at that moment that you need to respond to what God is doing. That is what we need in America today. We are not going to save this nation with programs. We are not going to save this nation with all these ideas. And it's not going to be saved politically. It's not going to be saved if we put the right person in the White House. That is not going to save this nation. The only thing that is going to save us, saints, is a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival. I mean the type of revival that we have not seen in well over a hundred years. Did you know that our nation was founded, saints, during the uh, First Great Awakening? And God sent various ministers over from England and other places, and they began to preach. And I think about some of these men, and I have gone to some of them's graves, and I have studied their lives very thoroughly. But understand that this nation was born in the fires of revival. God was moving powerfully. I mean, revival was sweeping through the land, and God was moving in magnificent ways. In the 1800s, during what was commonly known as the Second Great Awakening, it was around the year of 1801. And I thought I might just share this with you this morning because you may find it quite interesting to understand how that God used people and how powerfully he moved. There was a time when there was a revival known as the Cane Ridge Revival. And the Cane Ridge Revival took place, and as a matter of fact, it was considered to be the first what we would call like brush arbor meeting how many have you ever been to one of those you ever been to an outdoor meeting where it was like an old brush arbor and and they would set it up not not been to an actual brush arbor meeting but i've been to where they had kind of replicated and the men would dress in cover halls and they would put the thing out there and they would preach and all that but listen if you go back 
If you go back 100 or 200 years, more than 200 years now, that is the first type of meeting that was held in this nation where God was really moving by his spirit. And I want to just tell you really quickly about a young man who decided that he was going to go to one of these meetings. This is an actual account from the Cain Ridge Revival. His name was Finley. Here's what he said. I had lived throughout my life in a thoughtless and wicked way, resolving and resolving upon mending my ways and doing various things to straighten out. But rather in my life, he said, I only grew worse and worse till I arrived at 20 years of age. And about this time, there was a great revival that took place in Kentucky. It was attended by peculiar circumstances so as to produce tremendous alarm all over this country. It was reported that hundreds who attended the meetings were suddenly struck down, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days, and they would be left unconscious, and that when they recovered, they came out of that state, they would commence praising God for his pardoning mercy. Now, I, I read through this, and this is an actual historical account of what took place in this town. And I can tell you, saints, that sounded like Paul's road to Damascus experience. God was moving so powerfully in this way. Notice what he said. He had determined that although many others had gone to the meetings and fell under the weight of their sins, they came under conviction that he wasn't going to go through it. He said, it's going to happen to me. He determined that he wasn't going to get emotional. He wasn't going to get scared into becoming a Christian. So what did he do? He resolved himself and headed to the meeting. As soon as he arrived, here's what he said. His mind was sobered. And there was a, a resolute attitude that came over him. When he looked up, he said, I saw a scene so novel and unaccountable that it was awful beyond description. The vast crowd, supposed by some to have been 25,000 people, were gathered together. He said the noise was like the sound of Niagara Falls. He said there was a vast sea of human beings that seemed to be agitated amongst each other as if by a storm. He said, I counted seven ministers all preaching at once, some on stumps, others on wagons, one of them up in a tree that had fallen down onto another tree. He said some of the people were singing, others were praying, some were crying out for mercy in most piteous accents. He said, while others were shouting most vociferously. And while witnessing these scenes, he said, I got a peculiarly strange sensation like I had never felt, and it came over me. He said, my heart began to beat really fast. My knees trembled. My lip quivered, and I felt as though I needed to fall to the ground. He said, a strange supernatural power seemed to pervade this entire mass of people. He said, I became so weak and powerless that I felt necessary to just sit down. And soon after, he said, I had to flee to the woods. He couldn't take no more. So much conviction was in that place, saints. There was so much conviction among this group that he fled out into the woods. He said, I tried to philosophize and think about what was going on, all these ex exhibitions, all this excitement, all this religious enthusiasm I seen. Maybe it was inspired by the songs. Maybe it was the singing. Maybe it was the preaching, he said. He said, but my pride was wounded. For I supposed that I had the mental and physical strength to withstand such influences. But he wasn't able. After some time, he said, I mustered up the courage. I guess I'm going to go back, see how it's going. I mean, you know, God wasn't done with him yet. There was still something, even though it was terrifying him, that was leading him back to this revival meeting. 25,000 people strong. He said, the scene that then presented itself to my mind was indescribable. He said, at one time I saw at least 500 people swept down by the power of God as if the battery of a thousand guns had opened upon them. Think of that. 500 people at one time swept down into the power of God. What ended up happening? He said, I heard sounds of shrieks and shouts from the very, as it were touching the very heavens. He said, the hair stood up on my head. My whole body trembled. 
My blood ran cold in my veins. I fled to the woods a second time, and I wished I'd have just stayed home. Imagine the scene. While I remained here, my feelings became intense and unsupportable. I felt like I was suffocating. Blindness seemed to come over me, and I thought I was going to die. This is his experience. This is his firsthand account saying what he ended up doing. He said he couldn't take any more. So he ran out of the meeting. He ran home, ran out into the field next to his house, and he began to cry out to God at the very top of his lungs. God help me. Lord save me. God help me. Scared the neighbors to death. They didn't know what was going on. Somebody starts screaming, God help me. You know, next door to you, you'd probably be nervous too, right? Finally, he went out in the field. The neighbors came out to see what was going on. But there was a Dutchman who just barely spoke English, who saw what was going on. You see, he had collapsed. He fell out under conviction. And this Dutchman came up, picked him up into his arms and carried him all the way home and laid him in his bed. Laid him in his bed. The old Dutch saint directed me to look to the Savior. He then kneeled down by my bedside, began to pray for my salvation most fervently. He spoke in Dutch. He spoke in English. He then rose and sung the songs of Zion in the same manner. He kept singing and praying alternately until nine o'clock at night when suddenly he said, my load was gone. My guilt was removed. And presently, I received a witness from heaven that I was saved down in my soul. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, I received a witness. There flowed such streams of love as hitherto the waste and desolate place of my soul had never known that I thought I was going to die for the excess of joy that was flowing in my heart. He said, I cried, I laughed. I shouted, and so strangely did I appear to everyone except my Dutch brother that they all thought that I'd gone insane. They thought I'd gone mad. How I many you know not everybody's going to understand it when you seriously get full of the Holy Spirit? They aren't going to understand it when you're truly changed. They're going to say, this guy went crazy. He done lost her mind. This woman done went mad. But notice what he said. After a time, I returned to my friend and we started on our journey serving the Lord. Oh, what a day it was for my soul. You see, saints, that's the type of revival. That's the type of change that birthed this nation. It wasn't this mamby-pamby, wannabe, pretentious Christianity that doesn't change anybody. It's this kind of radical thing. Where people, when they get up off the floor, they get up out of the bed, they're so radically changed that people think they've cracked up and lost their minds. They're not the same anymore. I had to get a whole new set of friends because of the move of God that took place in my life. Listen, saints, we need revival in America. We need God to move in a way that he hasn't moved in over 100 years. Yeah, God moved powerfully in the days of the healing revivals in the 50s. I don't take away from that. And I know God's moved powerfully in other places, in little pockets. But we need God to sweep across this nation before it's too late. Because listen, saints, it's like the ark of safety. There's like the door is still open, but, but it's like there, there is a word going forth. Get your house in order. Get ready. Get saved. Because that door is about to close. And when it closes, saints, it's going to be too late. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Father, we're so grateful this morning that you saved a man who was so far away like Saul. And you made